Good evening, welcome to the Adventurers Club of Los Angeles. My name is Rich Mayfield, I'm the treasurer. I'm filling in for Ken Hudson tonight. Tonight we have a very special program. We have Steve Elkins with us, member 1209, and Steve discovered a lost city. Steve, thank you for being here. My pleasure, been here many times, and I appreciate everybody showing up because I've actually talked about this a few times here over the years, but there's always something new. And I hope you enjoy some of the things you've probably never heard or seen before. So now we're going we're gonna to unpack the lost, the lost City and the finding of it and everything, but we want to start out. Uh, you're making a movie based on this experience, right? Well, we did make a movie. Okay. And we recently sold it to a major network. I'm not allowed to say, but I think some of you already know who it is. And it's supposed to be broadcast later this year. Hopefully it will be, and I'll let everybody know. But anyway, a while ago we made a trailer about the documentary. The documentary has been edited additionally since then, but you can watch this one minute and 53 second trailer, which will give those of you that aren't familiar with the project a taste of what it is. All right, Andy, if you can just bring these mics down a little bit before we continue. Testing, that, that sounds much better, thank you. All right, when you're ready, we can run, run, run that trailer. It should be the first, first one up there. Well, that's it. We're done now. <laughs> so, so you actually did find a lost city. Yes, certainly that, did. That currently, you know, be, before you discovered it, you know, obviously someone made the city, but it, but it was completely undiscovered. Right. And certainly in modern times, nobody knew it existed. Well, there are some people that claim that it, they did, but actually about a year, just before the pandemic, we, got, we were able to make contact with some of the tribal elders and the indigenous groups there with the help of the Honduran uh, Archaeology Institute. And they said, we took them out there by helicopter, and they said, my God, we'd heard stories from our grandparents about this. We had no idea it really existed. And uh, this elder was in tears. So we knew that, in fact, nobody in modern times knew exactly where this place was. It was there were stories for hundreds of years, but no one had actually ever been there. That was pretty amazing to me. So take us back to when you first, I'd say, get the, got the bug. When did you first learn of this, and when, when, when did you decide to make it your mission well, to try to find this place? You have to go back to 1994. Um, I was in the production business. I was a cinematographer. I had a production company. And I was interested in doing stories that dealt with uh, adventure and science. And I had heard from another person who was an adventurer and a treasure hunter and so on, a rock tour. He said, oh, there's this really cool story about a lost city in the jungles of Honduras. It's called Ciudad Blanca, which means white city. And I'm looking for it. Maybe you want to come with and make a TV show about it. 
And I said, well, that sounds interesting. He says, it's really cheap to do production in Honduras. And I, I got some guides, and I'm sure we'll find it. So I fell for it hook, line, and sinker, and I decided to do it. I raised the money with a, one of my clients was a broadcaster in Germany. The CEO of the company said, I'll help pay for it if I get to go with. I said, you got a deal. And in 1994, a group of 18 of us went to Honduras. I had never been in jungles before. I knew nothing about what I was doing. I read up on it. But uh, we went, and we were three weeks hacking our way through the jungle, like in an Indiana Jones movie, having all kinds of adventures and misadventures, until there was one day when I saw something that made me believe, you know what? I think that this legend could be true. And what happened, and I don't know if, if Andy can find it. Yeah, we picture. have this picture, okay. right? This is with the, the rock and the chalk outline. We've been hiking for days, slogging our way through the swamps and then up through the jungle with machetes. And we're in this river, very nice river, and there's this big boulder. And there's this carving on it, which you can see. We had an archaeologist with us from the government who outlined the petroglyph in chalk so we could see it better. I understand that's a technique they no longer do. I'm not sure why, but it worked. And it looked like to all of us to be somebody with a strange hat and a bag full of maybe some seeds and a stick. So we thought maybe he was a farmer. Some people thought maybe he was some kind of a shaman. We don't really know. I figured he was a farmer poking a hole and putting seeds in there. And I look, at, look out at the jungle in front of me, and you can't see more than 20 feet. I couldn't see beyond Jim Heaton here. That was about it. And I'm going, well, how can they be farming here? You know, certainly not in modern times the way it looks. But I did have a background in the geosciences, and I once worked in paleoclimate research right out of college. And I knew that environments changed and that people often were the catalyst for that. So I knew it's possible that hundreds or thousands of years ago, this environment was probably very different. The climate was different. Everything was different. And perhaps there were farms. And to see this this carving, this petroglyph, in the middle of nowhere, that told me that something was going on in the past. And at that moment, I had an epiphany and became obsessed to trying to prove or disprove the legend to find out exactly what it was. And I spent the next 20 some odd years in my spare time trying to do just that. So this first time that you went out there, what, uh, how did you know where to go? Were you just wandering around the jungle or? Well, this adventurer, that first told me about it, his name was Steve Morgan. Uh, he was from San Pedro. He had been spending a number of years looking for that in other places. And he says, I think I know where it is. And he hired some local indigenous guides that said they think they know where it is. So we went in a general vicinity, but it was really kind of the blind leading the blind. Mm -hmm. And we did find things when we'd, we'd stumble on some artifact to be sticking out of the ground and you trip on it. Otherwise, we were walking and walking and slogging our way no clue. So when you showed up, basically, you said, we want to go try to find this city. And they said, sure, we'll, we'll take you. We'll take you, pay us, we'll take and, you. And, and, you know, well, maybe there's something up there, maybe there's something up here. Right. But you're basically wandering around the jungle. We're wandering around aimlessly. I mean, semi-aimlessly. We did find things, but we didn't find any city. But I became convinced that it was there anyway. When you, when you found that big rock right. near the river. Right. So um, I think there's a picture in there of you actually climbing. This is later, skipping ahead, but you're climbing the side Climbing up, it looks like you're climbing up a hill in a jungle. Oh, that's actually our chief archaeologist, Chris Fisher. But you can show that picture anyway, because it gives you, an, it shows you how difficult the terrain is. Um, is that picture up? I think I so. I can't see. Um, all right. But that's not terrain. That's that's, that's actually, actually the side. pyramid. That's a pyramid we found in the Lost City, and that's the side of the pyramid. And it's so covered in vegetation and mud, and it's raining all the time. The only way to get up there was to rope ourselves up. We had a you know, send someone go up there and tie a rope to a tree and then to another tree, and then everybody pulled their way up, and it was like slip and slide. So unless you have some way of knowing that things are there, you really don't find anything. And so, that's, that's where LIDAR came in. Yeah, so the, the Indiana Jones method of wandering around the jungle with a local guide and a map or wh whatever, it, you could literally be right on top of ruins and possibly not know that they're there. Correct. Um, I mean, you do find things occasionally if you stumble on them. Literally so, trip over them, literally. right? <laughs> and then the indigenous people, if, you know, if they go through the area, they oftentimes know where things are, and they take the outsider there and say, here it is. But mm -hmm. you know, people already really knew about it. You didn't know about it, but everybody else did. Right, it's not understood. In this case, we were looking for something that nobody had any clue at all where it was. 
So let's skip forward. So you, so you had that expedition, and you, you did find some stuff, but you didn't find what you were looking for. I'm going to backtrack for a okay. second. Because I know I brought the picture, and no one's ever seen this one. On that trip, I heard all kinds of legends about what was out there in the jungle. And one of them was, they said, oh, we can go to this village on the coast in the middle of nowhere where all the people have six fingers and six toes. And I went, what a bunch of malarkey. Come on, you're telling me about lost cities. Now you're telling me about six-fingered and six-toed people. And they said, yeah, yeah, it's there. I said, okay, let's go. So we went to this little village with a handful of people. And you can see the picture of this guy. I think he's up with six fingers. And it's a bigger six... handful than normal, right? Huh? So it's a handful of people. The what? It's a handful of people, right? Yeah. So it's more than we're used to. At least six. <laughs> Uh, I, yeah, so we're I going think, there, right? I think it was a very incestuous situation for generations that caused this. But there it was. There it was a whole village, not a lot of people, maybe 30, 40 people, with six fingers, and most of them with six fingers and six toes. So that also reinforced the fact that just because you think a legend is full of it, it might not really be false. There are many, many strange things out there that are worth pursuing to try and find out what they are. So this was a little side trip on your first expedition. That was one of several. Yeah. Okay. So um, after that, were you still? Did you still have the bug to discover the city? What? Because because you took a little hiatus, right? When was the next time you came back to Honduras? Well, actually, came back right away. Um, first trip was in '94. We made a couple of trips in '95 and '96 because we had discovered actually in a group of islands off the north coast of Honduras called the Bay Islands. We wound up going there because we heard that there were some uh, caves that were royal burial sites. And we actually went there and found them. They were pretty cool. They even had like little sidewalks made out of conch shells, of thousands of conch shells mm. leading to the burial site. And then the cave was covered in conch shells. And inside were the skeletons and some pottery and stuff. So we brought out some archaeologists with us. And that was sort of a sidebar story for a year or two. And at the same time, I was also convinced I still wanted to find the lost city and was trying to raise money to do that. And finally, actually raised a million and a half dollars to go there in 1998 with uh, Tokyo Broadcasting. They put up the money, and we got helicopters. We're going to do a whole big thing. I hired the Jet Propulsion Lab. We did satellite search. I think I had an idea where it was, but I, you know, it was kind of guesswork. And then Hurricane Mitch came to Honduras and destroyed the country. It was the worst hurricane ever to hit Central America in modern history. Hmm. Pretty much killed thousands of people and destroyed the economy, and end of story. So for a number of years, it was out of the question to even go there. But I quietly did my research. I kept reading. I kept talking to people and waiting for the right moment as I went on with my life. Yeah, so there, there is some history behind this. You said Ciudad Blanca, right? Right. Um, the title of the talk is City of the Lost Monkey God. Where did the monkey god well, thing come I think into first, it? Well, first, I think there's a picture of an old map from the 19th century. Uh-huh. And does he have that? We have that up. Andy? There's a map, old map. Cartoon. He's got a cartoon. <laughs> He's got the cartoon up there, right? He got the cartoon. No, it's, no, it's not a map. <laughs> Yeah, too bad I can't see what's there. Yeah, yeah. Our, our, our confidence monitor broke here, so we're lack, oh. lacking confidence. Did you find the map picture? Yeah. Is it up? This is a jungle. Area no, it's a map. Area of the Blue River. What? Area of the Jungle. No, no, a map. We might have, we might have missed the map. I guess you can't find it. Yeah, okay. if it comes up. Anyway, there's this map that the British made in the, the mid-19th century of Honduras, and the area of eastern Honduras is called the Mesquitia jungle these days. And back then, they called it um, Portal del Inferno. Excuse my poor foreign language abilities, meaning the gates of hell. And that was for good reason, because it was such a miserable place, so, such a tough jungle, and many people went in and never came back. So this is, where all, this is where it all was supposed to be. So this is on the eastern coast of? The eastern third of the country. Wow, that's a huge this, area. In, this incredible jungle. It's not quite as big anymore because of deforestation. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that was it. So, so the monkey god thing, though, where did, where did that come from? Well, the monkey god, the, uh, it's a very good question. Where did the monkey god story come from? Originally, Hernan Cortez the Conquistador 
wrote in 1526, when he first went to what's now Honduras, he heard about this fabulous lost city in the jungles of eastern Honduras. And people said that the buildings were made of white stone. Hence, Ciudad means city, Blanca means white. And that made sense because there's a lot of limestone in the area, and the stones have a, a whitish cast, and there's also white cliffs. So it's easy to say if you saw the cliffs and you know, if they're eroded, they might look like buildings, and a lot of the building blocks came from that kind of stone, so that's how it got Ciudad Blanca. That's the main idea on that. Then there was another story and I'm not quite sure the origin of that. It's sort of debatable. But they said that the people that lived there worshipped monkey gods. Well, that's not unreasonable because in a lot of jungle areas, people worship all kinds of animal deities. Why not a monkey? There's plenty of monkeys there. And they supposedly had this ceremony where they did all this hocus-pocus stuff with monkeys and so on. And that name stuck. <laughs> so people called it Sierra Blanca or Lost City of the Monkey God. And we renamed it something else altogether. <laughs> so when you, when you guys went, when you came back in earnest, right, you, you had new technology. Can you explain to us what that new technology was that helped yeah. you find this? So around 2009, um, I read an archaeology magazine in the New York Times, an article about a technology called airborne LIDAR, L-A-D-A-R, which basically uses pulses of laser beams, kind of like sonar or radar, to scan the surface of the earth, or any surface for that matter. And it had just, uh, LIDAR had been developed in the 60s for the space program for navigation purposes. And they started finding out it could really be a good map making technology because it's very, very precise. So a couple of archaeologists in Belize at the Maya site of Caracol uh, were introduced to it. And they had been in Caracol, which is a tourist site. Maybe some of you have been there. It's a great mine site for 25 years trying to survey the area, and they were getting tired of walking back and forth in the jungle. You know, you don't find too much. And these scientists said, well, let's try airborne LIDAR. Well, in three days, they found more than they would have in a century of walking. And this was, a, this was a revolution. So I read about that, and I went, you know, walking through the jungle aimlessly with a machete is pretty stupid. When you could fly in an airplane or a helicopter, or nowadays a drone, and scan the area and see underneath the canopy. It's the only technology that does it. The problem back then is it had not been proven to work in really thick jungle. Caracol was not that thick of a jungle. Where in Honduras, it was 50 meter, it's 150 foot triple canopy. The LIDAR engineers said, we don't think it's going to work. But if you pay us, we're happy to try. <laughs> so, I think we have a picture of that canopy, right? Just so yeah. everybody can see how is thick it is. Is there a picture of the canopy, of the forest canopy from an airplane? It would look just completely green. It looks, to me, it reminds me of when you go to the grocery store and you get a head of broccoli and you look down at it. That's what it looks like. No place to land. You can't see anything but the treetops. So this technology seemed like it would work. It was expensive, very expensive, and there was no guarantee. But in 2012, I was able to organize an expedition to go there with a plane, specially equipped plane, and scan the areas that I thought were potential targets. And I found those targets by looking at satellite imagery I commissioned from the JPL. I could find different terrain features that looked like if I was a king, that's where I'd put my kingdom a long time ago. And sure enough, those places panned out, and we found two cities using this LIDAR. Now, one thing that most people never think about, they like the adventure and all the, you know, slogging through the jungle and finding artifacts. But to put together an expedition like this, there's a lot to the backstory. It took a couple years of meeting with politicians, with kings, queens, and presidents, so to speak, wheeling and dealing, having to wear a suit and go to a lot of meetings down in Honduras to make it all happen. And I think there's a... Uh, yeah, so you can't just... You know, no, you rent just a helicopter. Waltz down there and do it. You know, you have to get permission. You got to convince the government that it's to their benefit to do it. You got to make sure that everyone's going to come out okay, financially or public relations wise. There's got to be a benefit. So I think there's a picture of in 2012 or 2013. At the time, there was a guy named uh, President President Lobo was in charge, and I'm there. Does, does he have yeah, a it's a group of, of you shaking hands. Yeah. Yeah, is this a group shot with me wearing a hat, straw hat with a yeah. black band? I'm making a deal with President Lobo. 
it's hotter there than it is in this room right now. <laughs> we were all perspiring. But he was, you know, he went along with it, and we signed the deal, and we all made our signatures, and they put the stamps on it, and we were golden, and we went. They were quite happy because it all worked out. That's pretty significant backing. Yeah, it was very significant. Without that, you know, without the president backing it, we wouldn't have had the military to help us. And, uh, you know, a lot of things would not have happened without those sanctions. And this was just for flying the LiDAR flights originally? That was just for doing the LiDAR flight. Just okay. flying around? Because they do have some problems with, with narcotics trafficking there, right? Right. There's a lot of narco trafficking there. It's a big problem. And, in fact, before we could do our flight, they didn't really have very good aerial reconnaissance in the area. Neither the United States, even though we had a military base there, nor the Honduran government weren't using the latest technology, or they let it slide. I don't know. But we had to send political emissaries out to the narco lords and let them know what we were up to, saying, you see this plane? Don't shoot it down. We don't <laughs> care what you're doing. Here's where we're going to fly. And we got their blessing. They say, yeah, OK, do your thing. Yeah. So, I mean, these are stories you never hear about. I know Pierre and I talk about these things often. And in his, his travels and adventures, he's had to do very similar things, as I'm sure others have. But this took a lot of effort, and it took money, and it took time, and it took a lot of political finagling, if you know what that word means, to make it happen. But without that, you go nowhere. So you've got to convince the, the government that you're not a narcotics trafficker and the narcotics traffickers that you're not the government looking for them. Right. They have to convince everybody we're neutral, we're only going to be benefiting the most people. Now, yeah. did you find anything out there? With the LIDAR? No, no, obviously. <laughs> did you find any narcotic stuff out there? What did, what did you oh, find no. in terms we of did, like not illicit find, activity? We did not find anything. Although I heard that in the last few years, they've been overflying some of the areas that we LIDAR scanned back in 2012. And they're claiming that they've found um, drug labs hidden in the jungle now. But that wasn't you. You, you just have to say that for YouTube. That. Right, right. <laughs> so yeah, we we came. We were clean. We were clear. Everybody loved us. It was so, a very good thing for the country. So you selected three areas to scan, and of those three, you hit on two of them. Right. Actually, I selected four, but one one of them, the fourth one. Uh, I looked at the imagery and I saw it had been deforested. There were logging, illegal logging operations. And I went, if anything was there, it's gone. It's been looted. So I scratched that. And then the other three, two of them, there were cities in. One was more compact. It became the more famous one where we found lots, hundreds and hundreds of artifacts. Another one was spread out. So we called one like Manhattan, the other was like LA. It was spread out over a vast area. Hmm. That one has not been surveyed very much. So we have some pictures of what, what the LiDAR imagery um, produces, right? Right. I think you can pull up. You saw what the forest looks like from the airplane, the visual view, like a piece of broccoli. Then there's an image of how the LiDAR device saw it with the canopy. It's colored in green, and there's a little blue river. Mm -hmm. Is that showing? Because yeah. I have no idea what's up. All right, and then through the magic of computer technology, we can erase that vegetation, and now it looks like the surface of the moon. And you can see that in that river valley, there are geometric shapes. And actually in there, there's a giant plaza, there's a pyramid, there's a whole bunch of buildings and stuff. If you know what to look for, it's all over that river valley. It's about two and a half miles long. So once we saw that, we knew that we hit pay dirt. And this really changed the game. The engineers were ec ecstatic because LIDAR actually worked in this really thick canopy. I was excited because all the money I raised and my backers and everybody weren't going to kill me. And, you know, I was not, it was not total folly. And we also proved to the uh, LIDAR people and to the archaeologists that this is really an effective way to look for ruins in even very thick jungle. It was the first time that LIDAR had been used purely as an instrument of discovery. Prior to that, they had always used it in a place where they already knew there was something, and it had partially been cleared, so they know they're going to find something. This was a shot in the dark. Can you just scan a totally unknown area in this incredibly thick jungle and actually find something? And we did. So now it's become the, uh, the tool du jour. Everybody's doing it all over the place. I think there's an animation that hopefully Andy can put up of 
a plaza in the city where we took the LiDAR data and made a 3D animation. Is it animating? <laughs> We'll see if it comes up. Okay. Well, anyway, hopefully it'll show up. And you'll see the trees, the great detail in the trees. He'll bring his mic down a little bit, all of our mics down a little bit, Andy. And then the uh, trees get lifted up and you see the plaza. It's pretty amazing stuff. Now, the tech, when we did it in 2012, so it's what, nine years ago, um, the laser, the LiDAR machine only shot out 100,000 pulses of laser light per second. Now they're doing it at a million pulses a second. So the amount of detail is incredible. But we had to fly over the same place many times at many different angles to collect enough data points. Now they can do it in maybe just one or two passes. So it's really advancing. Yesterday I received an email from an ethno a famous ethnobotanist that went with us named Mark Plotkin, who's uh, doing something with Dunbarton Oaks, which is a famous uh, school and academic institution in Georgetown in DC and saying, look what you started. And he sent me a list of this symposium they're doing with all these anthropologists and archaeologists all now using LIDAR to find and make discoveries in the Amazon and Central America and Asia all over the place. So it's kind of a nice feeling to know we were the pioneers and started the trend. That's pretty amazing. So, so when, you, when you guys would fly this plane, you, you would kind of do like a, you'd center it, you'd say, I, I think something's here and then you just kind of fly back and forth like well, you're mowing the grass? It's a little more, it's like mowing the grass, a little more than that. So we had target areas that I had picked out. Uh -huh. And we would make, I would get together with the LiDAR engineer and they would make a flight plan with the pilot, the LiDAR engineer and myself saying, this is the territory we want to cover. And we know we can shoot so many pulses and fly so many patterns. And so they try to fly low and slow. We used a very special aircraft that could do that and do that many times, collecting enough data, and then do it one way this way, then go this way, then go that way, until you, get enough, you think we got enough coverage. And then the engineers would spend all night processing that data. We get up in the morning and voila, there it is. And they're looking at the individual images, looking for any sort of pattern right. that's, that's, exactly. that's not natural, yeah. any sort of straight lines or geometric shapes. So the LiDAR expedition really was pretty posh. You know, and Doug in the book talks about he couldn't believe it was really an adventure expedition because we <laughs> stayed at a really nice resort on, on an island. We had air conditioning. We had lobster and beer every night. <laughs> we had a private beach, and people would just get in the plane in the morning, fly across the bay, go do the scanning for eight hours, and come back, and then they'd process the data. But that's modern-day uh, discovery. You have to use new tools to be able to find things that you couldn't could never have found any other way. So on that expedition, how many square miles do you think you covered on all those flights? I think that uh, they probably not that far, probably about 45 square miles. So it was a fairly targeted search. Yeah. And how, ba how big is this, uh, this wilderness, the Mosquito? 32,000 square miles. Wow. So, you're tar so, so that's not, not to lose that. Your targeting of those, those oh, yeah, no. four it's sites is pretty pretty spot on. In fact, the places that we targeted, I called them T1, T2, and T3. Target 1, Target 2, Target 3. How long would it be, take to explore those areas if you weren't doing it on LiDAR? That 45 square time. miles. First of all, you got to get there. Yeah. Which might take, you know, it's really tough terrain. If, is that from my shoes? Jeez. Oh, look at that. You brought the jungle with you. Yeah, sorry about or that. Or Lincoln um, Heights. <laughs> anyway, um, It'd probably take weeks, if not longer, to walk there if you could make it because it's a really tough jungle and you might not make it. It's happened. Many people try and they don't come back. Um, and then you're there. Well, plus you got to bring all your equipment. So you, that, that makes it even harder. Yeah. So it probably, you know, a month or two, maybe more, to mm -hmm. try and get there and you're not even sure where you're going. And you could be walking on top of the pyramid and you could you miss could it. You could be walking on top of a pyramid and just think, oh, darn, it's another hill I got to climb. <laughs> you never know. But with this LiDAR, you, you found the spots, you picked the right spots, and you were able to locate it in the imagery. So then when did, right. you, when did you actually get to see it? Well, it took three years. After the discovery was made by LiDAR, and was all blown up in the press and blah, 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 we knew that in archaeology, 
The only way to prove it is to ground truth it, meaning you actually have to go there, hold it in your hands and see it. So it took three years to raise the money, organize the expedition, get the politics down, get all the permissions, and go. So in 2015, we mounted another expedition, and I brought 12 PhDs with me in different disciplines. So no one can say that, oh, you don't know what you're talking about, you don't have a PhD. Well, I had 12 people to back me up. <laughs> um, and we did what was essentially a military operation. I hired three former British SAS jungle warfare experts. And why did I do that? Because I wanted to stay alive. <laughs> I didn't know what we'd be up against, both in the natural world and from the human world. So these guys could handle that kind of, that's what they do. And then at the last moment, the Honduran president gave us uh, a whole squadron of special Honduran Special Forces, which at first I was a bit nervous about, because maybe, <laughs> who knows what they're going to do. Why are they there? But they turned out to be great. They were really wonderful. This is the next president, right? So you had to meet... This is the new president. The yeah. new president of yeah. Honduras. And they were really helpful, and they have been to this day. They're really into it. They were fabulous, fabulous people. So we did this expedition by helicopter. little funny antidote. Because when we're organizing it, I go to Honduras to meet with the government and the Air Force and saying, hey, can I use your helicopters? They got Hueys. Well, they're Hueys from the Vietnam era. And they haven't always necessarily been maintained the best. And they said, yeah, you can use our Hueys, but we're not sure they're airworthy. You're going to have to pay to get them <laughs> fixed up. <laughs> and I went, that doesn't sound very promising. So we looked into... My partner and I in this, we looked into all kinds of things. Can we charter a helicopter somewhere else in Central America? Yes, but they're not, uh, we can't get insurance because they don't use the same safety standards, blah, 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 blah. That's not happening. We looked into buying a helicopter and then immediately selling it afterward to recoup most of the money. And uh, just before that, a guy I knew from the 90s who was a helicopter pilot that used to fly me around when I was a cinematographer in L.A., had a helicopter company in San Diego, and he's an ace pilot. You could eat off the floor in his hangars. He has a whole fleet of all kinds of helicopters. And he said, hey, I'll charter you one of my best helicopters, and my best pilot and a mechanic, and we'll stuff it full of brand new parts, and we'll fly it to Honduras, and that'll be your main helicopter. <laughs> and he made me a good deal, and that's what they did. They flew the helicopter all the way to Honduras wow. with the pilot and the mechanic and all the spare parts. So we knew we had one helicopter, now, it was only an A-star, so you could only put four or five people in it or two or three people in some stuff. But we knew that was a Ferrari of helicopters, and every day the mechanic went through it and replaced parts and so on and so forth. So we knew we had that. Well, then by the time we got down there, magically the Air Force had working Hueys, and they brought one of theirs out so they could take their soldiers and we could also take more of our gear. So the funny story is on the first day to go out, the original plan is we're always going to fly two helicopters at a time. In case something happens, they'll know where to get the bodies or whatever. So I take off in the really nice helicopter, and we're hovering, waiting for the Huey to take off with some of the crew that was not under my domain. They were working for National Geographic, so I didn't have liability on them. And the helicopter is going like this and pitching and yawing and rolling back and forth trying to get off the ground. And I said to my pilot, is this normal for that kind of helicopter? He said, hell no. <laughs> Finally, they get off the ground, and we're talking to helicopter to helicopter, and we're on our way to the jungle. And I look back, and all of a sudden, there's no helicopter. It's gone. Oh. And I went, my heart sank. I went, this is it. They crashed. They're dead. Everything's over. My life is ruined. Besides, my friends are dead. And for a few moments, that was a horrible feeling. And then all of a sudden... Over the radio, we hear the Honduran pilot going, we, made, we had a problem with our uh, stabilizer circuits, the computer, and we made it back to base. We're all okay. <laughs> Thank God. So we carried on by ourselves, which was against our protocols, but we figured, what the hell, we're here, we're going to go. <laughs> and they took them two days to fix the other helicopters, and then they worked fine after that, until a door fell off one. In flight. <laughs> but nobody got hurt and it, you know, stayed in the air. It's better than the seatbelt falling off or something like that, right? Right. right. 
So we have a picture of you looking down from the helicopter, right? Or, or looking down the first time you went to the site. Oh, maybe you should show the picture of the helicopter pilot, the Honduran helicopter pilot. Oh, yeah, I think we have the back of his helmet. You got that one? What's it say on the back of his helmet? Yeah. <laughs> so did, did they write that on his helmet after? No, after the guy, they all well, the guy came with the pa it's a removable patch, and a bunch of them started putting him on the back of their helmet. <laughs> This is normal. I, I guess it's was, normal in that helicopter, right, right? Right, I thought they had a great sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> That's rough. So you, you got to the site for the first time. You, you flew over it, right, and you, you took right. a picture. Did, did you get out of the helicopter? No, the first time we had to do a recce, a reconnaissance, we weren't allowed by the government to step out of the helicopter. We had to go with a, a, someone from the government, or a military person with us, and myself and a couple other people to go s check it out and make sure we could land there and... You know, no, everyone's feeling each other out because they're thinking maybe we're going to go steal something. We're thinking maybe they're going to kill us. We don't know, you know, back and forth. So this is a shot of that first view of the landing site from the helicopter, just that little teeny river. If you're looking at the right picture. Oh. You have the, the skid of the yeah. yeah. We still see the helmet. What? There you go. Oh. The skid of the helicopter. So that, is our, that is our landing spot by the Lost City, our initial one. And we, since we couldn't... We weren't supposed to touch down, but we're there, and we actually wanted to see how deep the water was. So the pilot went down, and we put the chopper in the river, which is only maybe this deep. It was no big deal. And he said, okay, that's going to be easy, and then we took off again. And the Hondurans were fine with that, and you know, we didn't get out. And then the next day, we all came back in mass and cleared, cleared a much larger. So what was it like sitting there in that helicopter? This is what, three three years after you first, you know, you, you're sitting on the beach sipping your, your, your beer and eating your lobster, and you find it. Yeah. And now three years later, you got to sit in that helicopter and just kind of like dip your toe in the water. It was pretty amazing. I mean, when I got out of the helicopter the first time, it was like being on holy ground. Here are all these years, all this effort, all this everything, and here I am standing in this place that I could only dream about for decades, and it really existed. And there we were, and I had somehow organized this whole group and the military and everything else, and we're really doing it. it was so when you stepped out of the helicopter, could you see the city? Was it the big white no, gates? And, no, no. What did you, what'd you see when you got out of the helicopter? When we got out of the helicopter by the river, all we saw was the river in the jungle. <laughs> and the first thing we did is figure out where we could set up camp. So those SAS jungle warfare guys, they were good at that. And they said, this is a good spot. Okay, we cleared away the brush. We set up our tents. That took almost a day to do all that and set up camp. Then the following day, we set out to go to the Lost City, which is about an eighth or a quarter of a mile. We're not very far. But you cross the heads on the other side of the river. You cross the river, and it's just solid, solid jungle. So we have to machete our way, which takes forever the first time, and blaze a trail. Now, how do we know where we're going? The magic of LIDAR. Because we had this detailed LIDAR data and maps of the area, we had this handheld LIDAR reader, so to speak. It looks like a giant cell phone made by a company called Trimble. And on there is actual, the LIDAR map is there. And since you can get a satellite feed almost anywhere, it has a little cursor, just like you do in your phone or your car, and it shows where you are and where you're going. So we knew we wanted to go to the Lost City, if we put that in there. And it's telling us you got to go this way. Make a left over here, make a right there. Of course, you got to hack away and make your trail which was a big effort and a lot of problems. But at least we knew we were going to the place that we wanted to go to. And then we get there, and we go, we, we, uh, we saw the plaza first, which you know, is not very impressive when you see it because it's kind of a flattened area, but it's all full of trees. But all of a sudden, we started seeing some carved stone walls. So, okay, Eureka, we know at least we're here. And then we looked for the pyramid, and we're all going, well, where is it? The cursor says it's over there, but all we see is a hill. Well, that hill was a pyramid. So hmm. the, the LIDAR at least got you in the zone, so to speak. But then you had to go old school and walk around looking for each individual piece. In fact, we spent two days just surveying the stuff we could see on LIDAR, which were the walls and things like that. And at the end of a long day, and it's raining, and we're all bitchy and tired and there's a cameraman behind me, and he stumbles. He says, you know, there's these funny-looking rocks I just fell down on. you got to take a look at them. I run back. 
there's 52 beautiful carved stone effigies sticking out of the, partially sticking out of the ground. Huh. So still serendipity played a part. The LIDAR got us in the target area, but it didn't find the little details. That just happened by luck. You know, we're just walking and we stumbled on it. And everybody went crazy. The archaeologists couldn't contain themselves because the stuff was simply gorgeous. And in fact, the first thing we saw was this head of an animal sticking out of the ground that kind of looked like an ape. And we're all jumping up and down. This is it, the lost city of the monkey god, because of course that's what we wanted to believe, right? Especially me. In fact, I, ordered, I gave the guy who stumbled on it 100 bucks for being the first guy to find something. Is this that artifact, the image that you gave us? No, no. Okay. It's not that one. It might be in the pile. It's just a face, not the, not the last one. And we're looking at it and going, you know, it does look like a monkey, except the ears are on top of its head, not on the side like an ape. And we went, oh, it's like a jaguar, or some <laughs> supernatural jaguar. We wound up actually renaming the city. The government renamed it Ciudad del Jaguar because there was a lot of real jaguars there and a lot of jaguar statues. So there went the monkey god statue, and instead we got jaguar statues. Just as good in my book. So, so you, you may not have found the city of the monkey god or Ciudad Blanca, but you did find a city, right. and now well, it's called the city of the jaguar. Well, officially, it's called Ciudad del Jaguar. However, Ciudad Blanca or La City of the Monkey God they might just, more than likely, they're an amalgam of many stories that became a place. You know, it's not really all myth, but it's not all true. It's just many places combined into one. However, the archaeologists have been working there since 2015, for six years now. And they don't work there all the time because it's a miserable place. And they have a lot of political and financial problems there. Um, but they're finding out that this culture Whoever built this was totally unknown. They had no idea who these people were. They were not Mayan. They were not Olmec. They were not whatever. They were some unknown culture. We were able to do some radiocarbon, and the dates were coming back as old as 4,400 years ago. So we know it's been there a very long time. The latest research, which they're doing, shows that this culture is probably much older than that and originally migrated up from northern South America to lower Central America and then mixed with all the other groups like the Maya, the Olmec, the Aztec, or whatever, over time, and formed their own unique culture. We did wind up finding some sort of glyph-like symbols. At first, no one could make heads or tails out of them, but now they're beginning to try and actually understand them. Um, more and more artifacts, more and more stuff being found all the time. I'm waiting for an update, maybe, hopefully, at the end of the week, about what the latest findings are. So besides all that, which is it's a great archaeological find, we noticed when we were there that the animals were not afraid of us. It was sort of like an inland Galapagos island. When we'd sit in our tents, um, the animals would just walk around. The jaguars, the tapirs, whatever was there, just walk through camp like we were a tree, could care less about us. And we thought that rather odd. The jungle warfare guys couldn't believe it. They'd never seen a jungle like that. So we thought, maybe this place is special. We wound up commissioning a, bi a bio survey with Conservation International and Wildlife Conservation Society, and they sent a group of biologists there. I think we have a picture of them, a bunch of them by a helicopter. And they spent a couple weeks there surveying all the animals, the flora and the fauna. It took them two years to write their report. It came out, it's a couple hundred pages long. And I think there's a headline uh, graphic yeah. Yeah. It says that this is a magical place biologically. It's actually the most biodiverse jungle left in Central America and the heart of the wildlife corridor between North America and South America. So this was very special ecologically. Not only was it interesting archaeologically, but also ecologically. And that many species that migrate back and forth and many species that they thought were extinct were still thriving in this jungle. And there were new species. So it's a very precious place. However, it's gravely under threat. There was a lot of illegal deforestation going on. There's narco trafficking, wildlife trafficking, blah, 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 the whole litany of things. So we wound up forming a foundation, the Kaha Kamasa Foundation. There might be a graphic pop-up with the government and got 
some money and have biologists and archaeologists working there all the time, and they're trying to control the situation. We came up uh, with a plan to train local people to become forest guards, with all kinds of stuff going on. And we were making some really good success until the pandemic hit. And once the pandemic hit, it all kind of fell to pieces. People are still working there, but they're limited because of money, because of the COVID and so on and so forth. And in the interim, a road is now being cut right through the bio bioreserve. The area was considered, is considered a UNESCO bioreserve now. But there was no muscle to enforce that. So the narcos are building this highway right through the jungle. Now it's a little ways from the lost city, but it's still in this ecosystem. Just in the last few weeks, all hell's broken loose, and you know a lot of people around the world are trying to put a stop to that. But in the end, it's all about politics and money. I hate to say it. It's the same all over the world. And it's unfortunate because if this area goes, and it could, there will be a cascade of ecological disasters that will affect everybody. So just to orient trying. everybody on this, um, this really is at the crossroads of the Americas, yeah. right? Um, you know, is it right on the equator or is it a little bit? No, it's 15 degrees north. 15 degrees north, but you know, that, that, it's right there. Unfortunately, it's, the, it's a little, you got the Yucatan, which sticks out off of like where Cancun is in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And just below it, there's another point, and that's the Mesquitia jungle. So it's a great point if you're, if you're a drug dealer in Colombia, all right, and you take your boats and your planes and you go to the Mesquitia because it's lawless. So that's where they offload the, the planes and the boats. And then they have more boats and submarines on the coast and then they go to Mexico or they go to the United States. And this culture that was there is completely unknown before, like before you said, but, but right at the middle unknown. of everything because right this would have been on. So in ancient times, this area was probably you know, sort of like a trading they believe it was a trading uh, culture because it was so easy for them to go places by boat and by land. This is what they're finding out. So the history of the Americas is continually being rewritten all the time, and all this will play a major part in that as more is learned. Hmm. It sounds like they're still using it to trade a little bit, huh? Well, yeah, the trade trading <laughs> is going on, going very well. But that's something that's, something that's um, you know, made it such a unique place, is, is how, how remote it is, how inhospitable it is. Well, it became a great place for narco-traffickers because it's inhospitable and it's lawless. There's really, there's no, there's no enforcement. Nobody wants to go there. out there. Well, I don't know if nobody wants to go out there, but they just, it's just been lawless forever. So it's a great place for the, you know, the criminal gangs to do their thing. So how did you get connected with the Honduran government in order to arrange all this stuff? Well, back in, 2000, back in 1994, when uh, this guy Steve Morgan told me the story, he had a high school buddy that grew up in St. Louis named Bruce Heineke. And Bruce uh, moved to Honduras years ago, and he, uh, uh, he was a strange guy. He worked for the Colombian cartel, doing favors for them. And he also worked for the DEA, just like a double agent. And he also, back in the 80s, he was an artifact looter. <laughs> so he knew the territory. He was a wheeler dealer. He made lots of money. He lost lots of money. And he knew how to deal with Latin American politicians really well, because they were all, many of them were of the same ilk. They understood each other. So Bruce was our fixer. If we needed a Baskin Robin Rocky Road ice cream in the middle of the jungle at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, if he had the money, it would be there. He'd get a helicopter or a plane and they'd parachute it down to you, whatever they had to do. So we needed connections with the military, with the government. He's the guy that could make them. In his later years, he passed away halfway through this project from living a rough life. He was you know, on the straight and narrow, but he knew how to wheel and deal. He knew the turf. And you know, it's easy to say you got to do everything straight up, but the world doesn't work that way. You know, you have to be able to work with the powers that be, and if you want to get things done, you have to make sure that the powers that be are getting something out of it, be it money, be it political points, be it fame, whatever, whatever it is. You've got to do that. Otherwise, you can't play. It doesn't happen. You know, I've been criticized at times by some people saying, well, you can't deal with these people. Well, okay, you don't deal with them, you don't do anything. Nothing happens. If I didn't do this, the whole movement to try and save the rainforest would not have happened. 
knowing about this unknown culture would not have happened. In addition, the people of Honduras have glommed onto this because this gave them something to be proud of. I gave a speech at a high school there where they speak English because my Spanish is not very good. And there were 90 students, and after this talk of this thing, every one of them came up and wanted to shake my hand and say, thank you for giving us hope for the future. The military even invited me to a talk show they have to talk to the troops because they were so proud to be doing something besides looking for narcos or you know, stopping a riot to do something positive for their country. So it showed them that there's a lot of good and a lot of really wonderful things in the country that they should be uh, spending energy on. And that wouldn't happen if we didn't do what we had to do to get this project going. And to put it into context, when you discovered this city, where, where did that put Honduran civilization? Like, uh, you, was it pre-Mayan, or, or where, where did it line up with everything? Well, Honduras is only a European construct. Okay, well, the, the, the area, though. Well, the area, nobody really knows when it all started. There was, Copan is a major Mayan city in western Honduras, mm -hmm. you know that. This area, where we're at, seems to have had influence from many areas. Some of the architectural style, some of the uh, artistic style has Mayan influence. So the theories, and these are all, our hypotheses are, that at some time during the Mayan Empire, people probably went out there and they traded, or maybe when the Mayan Empire fell, they, some of them went out there, maybe they had warfare, nobody really knows. You know, we'd love to be able to get skeletons to do genetic studies and maybe see where people came from. But my guess is that everybody intermingled. And there were probably cities and towns all over. I'm sure the jungle was completely inhabited. In fact, in 2016, the same LIDAR people that I hired did a LIDAR survey in Guatemala of the Pitan jungle. I don't know if any of you have ever been there. That's where a lot of the major Maya sites are. And people said, ah, oh, between these big you know, Maya sites like Tikal or Chichen Itza, there's nothing else. Well, it turned out that that entire area was inhabited in the past, and it was not a jungle. It was completely urbanized. Farms and towns, roads throughout that entire area. Hmm. And I think that the Mesquitia was probably like that at one time too, but it's all since overgrown. If you're not there maintaining it, nature takes over very, very quickly. So what are they estimating the population to be? Well, I know now? in the Pitan, I think they've upped the population by something like 8 to 10 million people. Wow. Which is quite a bit. And this shortly in the last year, they've been using LIDAR down in the Amazon in areas where they said, oh, civilizations could not be supported. The soils are not fertile enough. They didn't know that ancient people knew how to make that soil fertile. And it's just too rough, rugged, and now that there's been you know, LIDAR scan or areas have been deforested and they scan it. They just upped recently one area of the Amazon having a population of five million in ancient times. Wow. One small area. So there were a lot of people everywhere. And the world in the past is not necessarily what we were all taught or what we think it is. But with the power of new technology, new remote sensing technology, we're learning about the world in ways that could not even be imagined just a few years ago. In fact, there's a cartoon Hopefully he finds it. <laughs> we found the cartoon yeah, earlier, so I can pull it back up. from the New Yorker? Yeah. Okay, and I love this cartoon, because it sums up where we are today in terms of exploration and adventure. Mm -hmm. So there you are in your pith helmet and your canoe, and the crocodile, you're paddling, but you're worried about where you're going to plug in your cell phone. That's what it was for us. You know, we had to bring generators to make all our toys work, but without those toys, we wouldn't have found anything. And this is what it is today. The old way still works, but it's not very efficient. And we're going to be finding new stuff all over the universe, not just on Earth, but in the ocean, on land, in space, that's beyond any of our wildest imaginations. Fed, um, Greg there is going to have a heck of a time trying to, to make virtual worlds that look like that. Yeah. So what's the status of the site today? We'll, we'll, and and when's, the next time you're, well, yeah, when, when's the next time you're going to get well, to go down? Well, I was down? supposed to go down there do two expeditions there during the last year and a half, but COVID put an end to that. Uh -huh. The country got hit with two Category 4, four hurricanes a, year, a little over a year ago, back to back within two weeks. It's devastated them economically. And they got hit really bad with COVID. They still have bad COVID. They're just starting to get vaccinated, starting to get on their feet. You hear about the news, everybody migrating out of those places. 
because it's pretty bad. So hopefully things will turn around and I can go back there sometime soon. I mean, you can't even fly. I mean, commercial flights are, aren't even starting up yet. It's supposed to start up this summer. You got the guy in San Diego, though, with the helicopter. Yeah, <laughs> that's an expensive ticket. <laughs> yeah, I'd say. Um, and there's another area I want a lighter scan, which I'm sure is full of fabulous stuff. And then I heard from an indigenous friend of another spot where there's a cave that has supposedly a giant statue of a man holding a big rectangular platform. I, I kind of think like Atlas holding the globe, but he's holding a square platform. And we, I said I'd finance it because it doesn't cost much. Send a team there to walk there and go. But with COVID and everything, it just didn't happen. So those are waiting in the wings. So did you pass off the site to another archaeological team, or is it waiting for no, you I and your team to go down there? The government has their own archaeological team. Okay. So they know both of these places. And I said, go there any way you can. I said, I'm telling you what's there. you got to go. The first one, which is on top of a mountain, is really spectacular. But it's in the heart of narco-controlled territory, and they won't go unless they get military support. Hmm. So until they can get a military to go with them, they're not going to go there. They have to wait. And then the other one they could go to, but they've had an election year. There's some like political problems. It just doesn't happen. So do you think you're going to have to start the square one with the political uh, dog and pony show or whatever you call it, uh, the, the, the logistics to well, get back I'm, in there? I mean, it depends. There's a presidential election in November. It depends what party wins and who it is. And you have to see. I mean, everybody down there knows who I am and they know what I did. I mean, it is a big story in Honduras. Mm -hmm. I've been on every TV show. The book's out in Spanish. You know, they've had all kinds of ceremonies. So they, they, all want, they all want to do something. So I think when things calm down and things are better, that opportunity will exist. There's a lot going on down there right now. I mean, I hope it happens while I'm still able to go. Yeah. I, mean, I only got X number of years left, and <laughs> that's it. Well, you can always do more LiDAR scans from the beach, sipping, right. well, sipping I, the beers and eating no, the lobster. No, I can do LiDAR scanning from here. In fact, the group that I was going to send to go to this cave, they live there, so they don't have to worry so much about the COVID. And I wasn't going to go because of that, so I was going to give them a sat phone, and they would go and report to me hopefully every day. And I could take pictures and send them to me, and I could see what was going on. So I could conceivably do an expedition remotely, but it's not the, it's not the same as if you're really there. Yeah. Now, with this data, you know, it's interesting because, you know, oftentimes we see, you know, like with, with Google satellite imagery, before you would have to commission a satellite, take some pictures, then you looked at the pictures, right? right. Now we have almost the entire globe image. Are we to the point with LiDAR imagery where we're having problems like processing it? Because we got to have people look and say, oh, that's something that's a well, city or that's not. First of all, there's not that much LiDAR imagery yet. There is a big movement to do a global, global LiDAR scans. There's a lot of political issues because not every country wants to have detailed maps made of all their territory. So everybody knows exactly what's there. That's a big problem. Mm -hmm. It's also still expensive. And we're talking not terabytes of data. We're talking what, what's, what's like zigabytes or something. Yeah. Massive, yeah. massive amounts of data that have to be processed. It's probably on the order of Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> so these are problems, and people are working on it. In fact, our chief archaeologist, um, who's been a big proponent of LIDAR archaeology from day one, set up this thing called the Earth Archive. And he's having a symposium this week with all the companies and people that are involved in it. And they're trying to build the momentum to LiDAR scan the entire globe. Their first ambitious thing is to do the entire Amazon. Hmm. And that's going to cost, I think, 20 or 30 million, which isn't a drop in the bucket on the global scale. And th but then you have to process that data or get people to look at it. Well, you know, there'll be a lot of graduate students that'll look at it. <laughs> so how much data do you think, for, from your 40, you said around 45 square miles, how much data was that? I don't know. I never paid attention to like the data size. All I know is it fit on a hard drive. Okay. So a couple of, t couple of uh, maybe a, ter a couple of terabytes or something. Wow, that's still a lot. Yeah, well, you know, now a terabyte is not a big deal. Yeah. 2012 it was. Yeah. But I mean, when you're talking about, I mean, that whole area was 32,000 square miles. 32,000 square miles? Yeah. yeah it's been shrinking a, every day. It's a lot of data, though. <laughs> yeah. A lot of data. Yeah, I guess, uh, unfortunately, you don't have to image, image the spots that disappear, right? Well, yeah, 
no, you're not going to, yeah, you don't have to. So when, when, when these guys, you know, that's an interesting thing. When these guys run, clear cut a forest or do whatever they're doing and destroy part of that area, if they were hap to happen up upon a city, what, what would happen to it? They would, you said, you well, mentioned in passing they would loot it. Yeah, that's, but, probably, that's normally what they would do. And there's a black market for this there's stuff? There's a huge black market around the world. I mean, it's illegal, but it's still, still going strong. In fact, two years ago in the second city that we found, we called it T3, doesn't have any other name, we had sent some survey teams, and they were out there looking around, surveying on the ground. And one day they go out there, and they see some people out there with automatic weapons, and they're living in lean-tos they constructed, huh. and they're digging up artifacts and shooting wildlife. Huh. And so the military came out and arrested them, took away their guns, and sent them packing. It turned out they were from some villages, and they had spent six months hacking a trail. Hmm. And they came out with mules. And they were, you know, this is how they were going to make their living. They were going to steal the artifacts, sell them on the black market, and then kill the wildlife for food or for wildlife trade. I don't know what they were doing. But they, they confiscated everything and arrested them, and then they released them. So for all I know, they're back there again. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Okay, so this what is the we, world we live in. Yeah, what we like to do at the end here is we like to open it up to questions at the end, either from our YouTube chat or anybody out here, so we will pass that mic around. I see a couple people have their hands up. There's, there's the voice of Andy. Hello. Oh. Um, hi. Uh, first question from the chat comes from Lauren Mayfield. Thanks for the question. Oh, that's my wife. She says, forgive me if I missed this, but have archaeologists found any human remains there? So far, they have not found any human remains at the Lost City. We don't expect that to happen because if anything is buried in those conditions, it's going to deteriorate quite rapidly. Hmm. What we hope, what I know will happen is people who are of high society or high stature were buried in caves, and that can last for thousands of years. And there are caves in this mountain site that I want to go to that's not that far away, and I believe that's where they're going to find their human remains. And that'll really help kind of start to unravel that right. anthropological in picture. In fact, back in 95, there was a cave just outside the jungle. It was called a Cave of the We named it Cave of the Glowing Skulls, and I'll tell you why. It's, uh, its official name is Talgua Cave, and it was uh, a cave that all the villagers knew, and they'd go there for picnics. And one day, a couple of American Peace Corps volunteers and some local guys went, and they looked up, and they saw there was another cave system above the main hmm. cave. It was a big cave, like, you know, you walk in there like an apartment. And they brought back scaffolding, and they went and crawled up in the chambers up top, and they found these crystallized skeletons with elongated heads. If you were an Eric Von Däniken fan, you'd say it was alien skeletons. They looked like cone heads. And they were completely covered in crystals. It turned out to be calcite crystals. Hmm. And if you shone a bright light on it, like a flash, like a little flash bulbs, calcite will fluoresce. So you turn off the light, and for a few seconds, it glows. Hence, hmm. cave of the glowing skulls. And when we first found that everyone speculating, aliens, aliens, you know, because they got the funny <laughs> shaped heads. Well, we got. We got, I actually got an archaeologist from, from here to go down there. He's a cave archaeologist specialist. And they worked there for quite a few years. And it turned out, at the time, to be the oldest site in Honduras. It was over 3,000 years old. And it was a, a, a culture unto its own. And this, there was royal people that were buried there. And there's this beautiful pottery and ceramics and marble vases that were buried with them. There are quite a few skeletons. They're in the museum there now. Hmm. So we know that in the cave environment, the skeletons will last. So we just got to get those archaeologists into those caves. And what if, what if, what if they all had six fingers? That would really be interesting. I mean, <laughs> wouldn't he, it wouldn't be any stranger than finding the elongated crystal skulls, yeah, right? Well, the reason they got the elongated heads is just like in, Ch in ancient China, they would bind the feet of young women. And the, the Indians, like in the northern Rockies, like the Mandan Indians, the flat, they called them the flatheads. Because when they were born, if you were a certain uh, status in the culture, they'd put a board on your head before your bones fused to give you a flat head. So that way, your whole life, you would know that where you stood in the hierarchy. So they did the same there. If you were of royal lineage, they put a board on your head and gave you a cone head for life. So you look more like your alien overlords. Yeah, and if you look at some of the Mayan, Mayans did that, and if you look at some of the pictures, 
you'll see in like the royal people, the kings and stuff, they often have kind of conish shaped huh. heads and they have a cap on it covering the cone. <laughs> <laughs> That's fascinating. All right, next question. Exactly. How does it work? Well, Let's repeat that because his mic, mic's broken. Okay. He was asking. So um, what, what exactly is LIDAR and how does it work? Yes. Okay. It's called light detection and ranging. It was originally set up as a navigation tool for the space program and the military. It sends out many thousands of pulses of laser light per second and scans it back and forth. All right. And the laser beams hit something and then come back to, to the transmitter. And it measures the time and distance that it travels and it can then create a contour map. It can measure the distance as well as create a contour map of the surface that it was reflected on. Underneath. Underneath. So in this case, it's kind of like sonar in a way. yeah, it's just like sonar except there's laser beams. The same same concept. So this thing, the laser beams hit the, the leaves in the tree. Most of them bounce back to the plane from the leaves, so you get great detailed images of leaves. But enough of them make it through the tree to the ground, bounce back, and if you get enough points, you get a resolution, you can be as low as two centimeters, which is less than an inch of detail in an open ground. Where we were, with the technology available, we were about 18 inches. So the smallest object we could see was about 18 inches. But if it was open, we would have seen less than an inch. But that was big enough to see a city yeah. wall, or what were the structures that really gave it away? Yeah, the walls. Yeah. You know, in the shape of a building, you can see uh, drainage ditches, terracing, Anything that was bigger than 18, anything that was bigger than a foot and a half. And this is how you're really kind of detecting roads and, and right. infrastructure. Right, roads are easy to find. Yeah, because you see this big, long. Buildings are easy yeah. to find, walls. The little details like statues, no, you're not going to find that uh, with that. You're going to have to go down and see. Hmm. Eventually, you'll probably be able to. Or More burn points. down all the trees, then you can do it. Yeah. <laughs> all right, next question. One, one other oh, go ahead, Rob. Speaking something, are they speaking a language that goes back to Mayan times, or can um, you just get into that much? Well, from what I know, they, there's a bunch of different dialects, and some of them are only a few hundred years old. Some of them are like a patois of Spanish, English, Creole, um, native languages, a real mixture of stuff. And then there are the really old languages that go back far, far back, and nobody really knows. So. The anthropologists are trying to figure all that out now. Go ahead. We got one from the chat? We do. Uh, we got one more from the chat tonight from Steve Adams. Steve wants to know, were metal detectors of any use at the site? We did not take any metal detectors with us. Um, we really didn't anticipate finding much in the way of metal. And plus, in that very wet environment in the rainforest, it rains all the time. They're not particularly useful. The metal detectors? Yeah. That's interesting. And we really didn't, everything is stone, stone. Yeah. We didn't find anything of metal, period. Hmm. All right, more questions from the, Lance. Yeah, with your prediction, do you see this whole area being excavated, becoming a tourist? you know, destination, what, what do you see is going to happen with it? Well, that's a very interesting question. In 2013, after we had made the discovery, um, Foreign Policy Magazine honored me by calling me one of the leading global thinkers of the year for coming up with the idea of using LIDAR for discovery. So they had me come out to Washington, they had this big ceremony in Georgetown, it was great fun, and at the cocktail party, someone from the World Bank came up to me and asked me that very question. I said, so now what? And I went, hmm, I hadn't really thought about it. Yeah. And I quickly said, eco, high-end ecotourism. You don't want to have mass ecotourism because you'll wind up destroying the very thing you're trying to save. But there's enough people with enough money in the world that they'll pay a lot of money for a unique experience. And that can employ the people and finance the scientific work going on and not destroy the place. I told that to the government. They said, that's a great idea. And they went ahead and built a museum just outside 
the jungle at our staging area for our helicopters. With that in mind, they built a laboratory where the objects come out of the jungle and they, the archaeologists curate them there and put them on display. And they were talking about setting that up. And I said, well, maybe we should build like an eco, an eco vill, a small eco camp where the scientists can live and work there. And then these people paying a lot of money can go and live and work with the scientists and have the local indigenous people to give them a, you know, a jungle lore tour. And is, this will be minimal impact. We went out there, actually, went out there with the government architects to plan that, and they surveyed it. In the end, they made a decision, which I think was very smart, to not do it, because they said the damage will be too great. And so when you go out now, you got to go with a tent and live pretty basic, and you take it with you, including the government people. They have to do the same thing. At least that was two years ago, the last time I was at the site. Hmm. But that is... Well, it, it's a great idea to do it, and that's the only way that really works. Mass tourism just doesn't work in a place like that. All right, a couple more questions. You mentioned uh, um, the Amazon area. The what? Amazon? Yes. Um, being from Venezuela, I'm very interested. If that, would, would that be a good. Um, interest uh, point for you for a future expedition or somebody else's? Or is that in the eye or in the plans of eventually a future expedition? Oh, well, there's a lot of stuff work going on in the Amazon. There has been and there is, and I have friends that have been working there their whole lives. There's, and there's a lot of LIDAR and the similar things going on there. And they've had some very great success, and they've had some very terrible setbacks. You know, again, it's all about politics and money. Unfortunately. But it, yeah, the Amazon's a great place. Real quick, we just got one more from uh, the chat. Uh, from Raimundo Perez, uh, do you see virtual reality playing a role for LIDAR study in future exploration? That's a very good question. Is, can virtual uh, environments be used for further study? Absolutely. Um, when we did our LIDAR scan, one of the first things we did before we were planning to do our ground expedition, it took three years, is I went to a virtual laboratory at UC, um, Greg, you know, up near Sacramento. What? Not San Diego. Davis? Davis. They have a really good uh, virtual, reality, uh, virtual reality lab there. And we took our data to them. And uh, San Diego has one too, but I like the one over there better. They created a 3D environment, a virtual environment, so we could actually paddle ourselves down the river, walk through the jungle before we ever went there. So I already had an idea. I went into this room with the goggles, and I could, like Superman, fly around the room and see what the terrain features were like within the scope of the resolution we had. Now remember, our smallest pixel was 18 inches, so I don't have fine detail, but I could see the river, I could see the big mounds, and we kind of knew where we were going. And in fact, before we took the helicopters, we even made a, a, a cross-section model of the terrain where we think we wanted, looking for landing sites. First, I looked at the overhead view, and I looked for natural clearings. And I found a couple small ones. Then we blew up the LIDAR and made 3D models and cross-sections. And the pilots could then measure the distance between the trees and the ground and we could actually measure the depth of the water in the river and how high the brush was in pretty good detail. And so we knew ahead of time that we had a good shot of landing our helicopters in these particular places. Without, in fact, the Honduran military, when they saw that, they said, where can we get this technology? Because <laughs> they were telling us we weren't going to be able to put a helicopter in there for 20 miles. And we said, no way. Check out the LIDAR and the virtual use of LIDAR. LIDAR is used for virtual environments in the movie business all the time. Michael. Tell us a little bit more about the diseases that you and your others caught. What were the symptoms like? What was going through your mind? Were you worried about bringing them home and infecting the rest of the world? And, and how did Anthony, Anthony Fauci save the day? Well, we planned for every disease we could think of. You know, we brought medics with us. We bought all kinds of medicines. Our biggest concern was having anti-venom for fair, for fair to land snakes, which are really bad. Very difficult to get anti-venom in the world today. You would think you can, but 
it's only manufactured in a handful of places, most of them in Mexico now. At least they were a few years ago. And they're not always particularly effective. So it, that was a problem. And then we, we, we knew that certain diseases were a possibility, but we thought there were remote possibilities. The one that everybody got, most people got, was called leishmaniasis. That was low on our list. We knew it was possible, but we never thought it would really happen. So we went, nobody got killed, nobody got injured, nobody even got stomach flu. At the end of the expedition, I'm sitting at their staging area, toasting all my partners with a beer. Hey, we made it, everyone's alive, no one's sick, until we got home. And about a month later, half the crew had this little bug bite, looked like a bad mosquito bite, that didn't go away. We all had millions of bites, but one bite got, only got bigger, didn't go away. And eventually it started to form like a volcano, like a big weeping ulcer. They got bigger and bigger. And everyone's freaking out, including me. I didn't get it. But the, those that have it were not too happy. And we're calling around doctors, every doctor we could find in New York, in Chicago, in LA. Nobody knows what the hell it is. Oh, take, a, you know, take, take an antibiotic and two aspirin, it'll go away. No, 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 it's only getting worse. Finally, we found somebody at National Geographic who said, that's a leishmaniasis lesion, because they had had it once. And then, uh, Doug Pre and then Doug Preston, the guy who wrote the book, a friend of mine, his brother is friends with Anthony Fauci. And they said, well, you should come to the uh, NIH, and we'll check it out. And NIH, coincidentally, was being financed by the Defense Department to do a lot of research on this leishmaniasis disease because a lot of soldiers were coming back from the Middle East with a desert version of it. Mm. It's not just confined to tropical mm. areas. It has to be warm, but it can be dry or hot. And you didn't hear about it in the paper, but a lot of soldiers were coming by with what they call the Baghdad boil, the Jericho button, the similar thing. And the disease, it's a parasite, a protozoan parasite that lives in the gut of a female sandfly of a certain species. So the sandfly, like a mosquito, finds you, wants to drink your blood, and in so doing, the, the protozoan, which is living in the gut of the sandfly, comes through the proboscis, goes into your blood. And it likes to reproduce in white blood cells, particularly mammalian white blood cells. So your body launches a response. So here's an invader, let's kill him. Sends a million white blood cells to go get those protozoan, Leishman, Leishmaniasis protozoan. And they go, come on, baby, send some more. <laughs> they go inside the white blood cell, because the white blood cell can't kill it, and they reproduce inside the white blood cell and blow it up. So where you had one, now you got 10. Where you had 10, now you got 100. And your body says, oh my God, let's send more stormtroopers, sends more. And it, your body, your immune system goes haywire. And the lesions are not the protozoan chomping away. It's not eating your flesh. It's your own body. It's an autoimmune reaction caused by the body's inability to kill that protozoan. And you're, uh, it's, it's, it's basically you're autoimmune on steroids against you. Not everybody gets it. 60% of our people got it. 40% didn't. I was lucky. I got bit just like everybody else. Nothing. They don't know why some people react and some people don't. It just happens that way. When you get it, they can give you these horrific drugs, which is what they gave them at the NIH. The NIH offered, because they were studying the drugs for the military, and it also happens to <laughs> afflict 12 million people around the world every year. Um, so they said, if you sign up to be in our trials, we'll treat you for free. We'll fly you out there, we'll put you up in a hotel, in the hospital, and we'll treat you for forever. So our people, of course, jumped on that, and they went in. Some people had to stop treatment right away because they had such bad reactions to the drugs, it was destroying their livers. Some people almost died. Other people responded very well. Most people took, had to maybe make uh, eight to 12 sessions at a week at a time over a period of the last few years to, to put it in remission. You never get rid of it, it's with you for life. It may go in remission, but when you become immunocompromised, it may rear its ugly head again. So there is no known cure. And in fact, a friend of mine's a, a uh, parasitologist at Harvard Medical, and I was talking to him last year, and he said, you know, we noticed some of our transplant patients are coming up with full-blown leishmaniasis. We can't figure out why. I say, well, maybe the leishmaniasis is in the organ. 
And they looked and they found out that the patient that was the donor had had leishmaniasis sometime in their past. And it stayed in their body, unknown. And then when it went into the immunocompromised donee, Tony? Do, Tony, yeah. Yeah. It went crazy. So it's really insidious. It's like COVID in a way, you know, and it's out there. And because of global warming, the demographic range of this parasite is expanding further north and further south of the equator. And the CDC is estimating with current climate trends, it'll be as far north as Canada by 2050. So it's already in the southern states. In Texas and in Oklahoma, it's endemic. But obviously, not enough people are getting it that it's become a big problem. And there are varying degrees of it. Some people just get the lesions, and the lesions go away and leave a scar, and end of story. Other people, the lesions come, they go, and then it starts, a couple years later, it destroys all your mucous membranes. So if you go on Google, you'll see the horrific pictures. It doesn't kill you, but you might wish you were dead. Then there's a third version that destroys your internal organs is 95% fatal. So they don't know which one you have until you have it, and then they can do a genetic sequence and figure it out. Lovely. Yeah, yeah we all know, know another deadly disease tonight. Right. <laughs> so if, if Steve Elkins offers you a kidney, don't take it. Yeah, right. That's right. And Anthony Fauci and the whole crew at NIH were fabulous. They just treated everybody with kid gloves and, and did a great service. Yeah. So. Uh, are there Let's any do one questions? more question here. Any other questions from the audience? This, this civilization was big. I mean, you said five, eight million people, something well, like that? Well, not this particular, not the Lost City one. We don't really know the population numbers. Is, is, do you have a theory, or what's the theory on what happened? Well, I, I, well, there are many hypotheses of what happened. A common one now is maybe they got leishmaniasis, maybe they got, <laughs> maybe they got COVID or something else, because one of the legends, one of the uh, legends of the people there is that the people turned white, and then they abandoned it. That's one, one idea why they call it White City. So maybe they did get sick. Maybe there was an epidemic. Another one is warfare, um, climate change. Nobody really knows for sure. It's just guesswork at this time. Now, my belief, having been there and knowing what I know now, what's underneath all the jungles and what LIDAR and remote sensing is showing us, I think all these areas had large human populations at some point in the past. We just have to find the evidence. And I'm sure the Mesquitia had a lot of people living in it, and it didn't look like it looks now. Hmm. All right, well, Steve, thank you for joining us. Right, it's been great. Sorry for making a mess of the carpet. Oh, no problem. We'll take care of that. And for those of you watching on YouTube, thanks for joining us. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel, and we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for listening. So you know what I just found out? <laughs>